Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming, and I especially want to thank Kaijin for inviting me to give this presentation to you today. Um, I think the main reason they've asked me to be here is for some of the information I'll tell you at the end of our story, which is as we're translating genomics into the clinic, getting into um, the liquid biopsy area and trying to use that as a tool for monitoring patients' relapse and response to therapy. Um, we're quite early in that journey, um, so they've asked me to sort of talk about some of our, the work we've been doing in clinical whole genome sequencing. Um, so that's what I'm going to spend the first sort of third of the talk going through the next third about some vignettes in the rare disease space and some diagnoses that we've made in, in tricky to diagnose diseases, and the last third really in precision oncology, which I've just told you about. So I guess I've always been fascinated in the impact of genetic variation. I started back in the EQTL days where we were looking at healthy people and the impact of genetic variation on subtle regulatory variants and maybe phenotypic traits and how we, we, we look and appear. But then as we had the power to start to study whole exomes and panels and now whole genomes, you could start to get to the single base pairs that really define incompatibility with life or severe Mendelian genetic disease. I think it's really exciting that we're now in this era, era of being able to use you know, a single assay to look at this whole breadth of genomic variation at a reasonable price, heralding obviously the era of precision medicine. So we, we see that clinical genomics has really got a role to play in the entire spectrum of life, all the way from pre-womb to tomb, as Eric Topol wrote in this wonderful article, all the way from pre, pre, uh, preconception screening, carrier screening, non-invasive prenatal testing, all the way through to what we spend an awful lot of time on at Garvin Institute, which is um, diagnosing or undiagnosed disease, um, all the way through to cancer diagnosis and pharmacogenomics analysis. We really see that genomics has a role to play in this entire uh, whole of life care. So the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics is where I'm from, based in um, Garvin Institute in Sydney. Uh, we were formed in mid-2012 with the mission of providing whole genome-based diagnostics for routine health care. Um, we were funded, this is funded almost exclusively philanthropically. It would have been very hard to do this on, uh, on research grant funding. Um, so really the mission of our center, unlike many talks you might have heard, which are doing sort of research grade sequencing, delivering, you know, where the commodity is a BAM file and a VCF file, our commodity really is a clinical request form through to a PDF report signed off by a pathologist diagnosing the patient. So this is clinical interpretation of genome sequencing as a, as a, as a deliverable. Um, we achieved NATO accreditation, which is similar to the, uh, the American CLEAR accreditation about four months ago now, and on the back of that launched a genome diagnostic company called Genome.1, which I'll mention later on in the talk. So given we spent a lot of time sort of, we, we were formally researchers and turning ourselves into a clinical laboratory, we've had to think an awful lot about that transition from research to clinical and what that actually means, and I've borrowed this slide from a former colleague, Graham Taylor. So on the research side, you're like the F-22 Strider, Joint Strike Fighter Jet here, right? Original methods, bespoke analyses, surprising findings, following your intuition. Pretty accurate, but doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and obviously driven by different goals, like getting publications, discovering new disease genes. On the other side, though, with clinical, you need a process that's proven, reliable, reproducible, can be run by anyone in the laboratory, extremely accurate. Um, and denominator driven, you're often worried about the cost per diagnosis rather than producing papers. So very different mindsets and we all had to get used to doing that as we've become a clinical lab. So why clinical whole genomes? Why not exomes? Why not panels? Uh, I guess the first reason really is that we were one of the first three labs in the world to get the Illumina HiSeq X and that's a whole genome sequencing only sequencing platform. So at the time we were developing clinically, well, we we're trying to credit clinical exomes and then once we had quite cheap genomes available to us. Um, that was really one of the big shifts. We're quite proud to say we finally hit a, a significant milestone 24 hours ago of hitting 10,000 genomes. So I think that's just testament to growing the lab to about 60 people now and the, an, an enormous amount of infrastructure to be able to do this at capacity. Um, so more scientific reasons of why whole genome sequencing is a first line diagnostic test. We really feel that it's going to give us the most comprehensive characterization of a patient's genome. You can look at small variants, SNVs and indels, of course, but also large variants, copy number variants and structural variants, which uh, our principal scientist just gave a presentation on Ben Lundy. 
We can look at mitochondrial heteroplasmy with an amazing precision. Look at variation in untranslated regions, regulatory regions, and non-coding variants. And while we don't understand what most of those do today, there's been a number of extremely good talks looking at the epigenomics and mapping the regulatory elements and assessing the impact of genetic variation on those elements. Now we'll be assess aggregating that data and we'll have a great resource for the undiagnosed patients to start looking in those areas. One, one main reason though is we don't have to redesign our panel, our targeted sequencing panel, every time a new paper comes out showing a new disease gene. I think that's really important, especially for diseases that are largely uncharacterized and the rate of gene discovery is still going through the roof. Um, broad, even sequencing coverage. I think everyone that's done capture sequencing can can sympathize with that plot on the right there where you've got a capture bait that's missed half of the exon and, and we've seen a lot of cases that we've diagnosed with genome that were missed because of coding bases that were just not captured properly. I think everyone's probably seen that in the audience. Um, we can use in silico filtering to finally tune the, the list of genes related to the patient phenotype on the fly. And most importantly, there's, in the literature, there's a higher diagnostic rate than from exomes or panels. So this table summarizes uh, a number of published studies, the top half of the exome studies, and really in clinical diagnosis, we care about diagnostic rate. Most of those studies, even the larger ones with 2,000, 3,000, 1,000 individuals, are sort of centering around a 25, 27, 30% diagnostic rate. This does appear to be improving over time as the number of disease genes uh, grows. Um, some of these studies are a little older. Um, but on the whole genome side, while the studies are a bit smaller, we're starting to see around a 40 to 60% diagnostic rate from whole genome sequencing. So that's a pretty good reason to be using them. How is this being achieved? Well, I've already kind of given one clue is that we, we're finding variants in coding regions that were missed. It's true, we probably still look at a genome like, a, like we would look at an exome, we just get better coverage. And also through identifying small copy number variations in structural variations, which are too small to be seen by an array and maybe a little bit too challenging to see on an exome because of the variable coverage. Importantly, when we try to compare the actual performance of whole genome sequencing in red, exome sequencing in green, and true site one, which is a clinical exome in blue here, and we assess the sequencing coverage, depth of coverage, as a function of global depth across those three technologies. Um, what you see with the exome is that no matter how deep you sequence it, even out to 200x, it never seems to cover 100% of your target reliably. For clinical diagnosis where you don't, that might be a really good thing for a cheap research study where you're looking for maximum value for gene discovery, but for trying to get the maximum clinical utility and the maximum diagnostic rate, we, we would argue that you'd actually want near uniform sequencing coverage of your targets. When you break that down into, sorry, it's come off the side there. Um, when you break that down into targeted gene panels, related to phenotypes of interest, you start to see the impact of that poorer coverage where um, in the exome sequencing, a number of genes are no longer covered to, you know, a sort of a 95% level. So in practice, that just leads to um, a bit more uncertainty that if you're undiagnosed after an exome, what do you do next? I think it's particularly important for disorders like intellectual disability where the rate of gene discovery is still going through the roof. This was a recent 2016 paper from the Nijmegen group um, identifying over 700 intellectual disease disability genes and still rising. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to define a custom gene panel for disorders like this. Why not whole genome? Well, an obvious one is cost and we, we hope that the continued reduction in cost will, will make that argument go away. I'm not going to get into the cost of the clinical delivery cost, but actually the sequencing reagent becomes a smaller component of delivering this in a clinical environment when you have to factor in clinical geneticists, pathologists, um, genetic counselors, valid variant validation. There's a whole bunch of other costs that make that not the major determining factor. Complexity, I'd argue that today we treat our genomes just like an exome, so we're, with a good knowledge base and a good clinical genetics team, we can largely tame that. Uncertain clinical utility at the time, I think the number of studies I've shown you on the previous page is showing that the diagnostic rate for genome sequencing appears to be around the 50, 40 to 60% mark. And there's always the risk of unsolicited findings, but we would argue you can mitigate against that by really focusing your analysis to the genes that are related to the phenotype of your patient. So largely things that I think can be overcome. So one of the challenges, you know, we're, we're a strong bioinformatics team and a research team, and we really didn't want to get stuck in this clinically regulated environment where we couldn't move, where we couldn't update things to keep pace with all the, the advances in um, 
in the research space for bioinformatics especially. So I think two of the things I'll just touch on today is developing good software and good change management procedures. So this is the only real slide on the bioinformatics pipeline that we've developed. It's essentially a standard BWA GATK pipeline that runs on the cloud. Um, we've combined that with a, a copy number and structural variant pipeline called varpipe SV, which um, my postdoc Andre Minosh has developed, um, funneled into a variant filtration platform called Sieve. So that's not kind of the cool bit. I think what we really wanted to do is know that every component of the pipeline is built to decent specifications. So every piece of software is wrapped in this testing framework so that if you break something, you know, and your end-to-end -end tests start to fail. I presented this recently to a number of bioinformatics audiences and was surprised to see that other clinical labs aren't taking this degree of sort of software engineering principles into place. So I think that's um, a good thing that we've been able to do. We're confident that our tools work. The other thing that I think is really important is um, handling change management. If you change something in your pipeline or you change something in your analytical stages of your pipe process, you don't really know what the impact is, especially when you're sequencing the entire genome. So we spend a lot of energy developing this um, perf detailed performance report from a whole genome. So whether you want to change something in your chemistry or your, your sequencing instruments or bring a new machine online, you can sequence a gold standard reference material and put it through the bioinformatics pipeline and end up with a detailed performance report. If you change your bioinformatics, then you can just sequence some, some data that you already have with known truth and again, assess the impact of that. It allows you to swap out sequence aligners, variant callers, start tweaking parameters and know how how your tools are actually working. So this is some of the insights that we get from that diagnostic report, which ultimately helped us clinically accredit this process, is to look at the detection uh, sensitivity to detect heterozygous in red and homozygous variants for SNVs, insertions, and deletions up to 20 base pairs. And you see that after about 15x depth, the sensitivity really plateaus off, and that's essentially what we see when we get an average 30x genome 96% of the genome is covered to 15x, giving us the, the confidence that we can call variants in most of the genome. Very low false positive rate, especially once you get above 15x depth. Most of the false positives are here in the 5 to 9x range, where you've got enough evidence to try and make a call, but you probably don't get the call right. Um, we were really happy to win the recent precision FDA challenge for the, most, the highest SNP precision in our pipeline. We we're excited about that because this was from another sample that we'd never sequenced or analyzed before. So we were confident now that we're not overfitting our tools to the one cell line that every clinical lab has sequenced to death, which is 12.878. So enough of the technical things. Um, how are we actually is going to move more into the vignettes from using um, whole genome sequencing? Um, so along the bottom, we've seen a number of research studies that have come out of my, my lab. So Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, we saw an 86% diagnostic rate. Hereditary spastic paraplegia, a movement disorder, 40%. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy, we're at about 50%. Mitochondrial disease is about 50%. And on the back of improving our process through these research studies, this is about the time we decided we to become clinically accredited. We sequenced 31 cases with known mutations um, and all identified 100% of those pathogenic variants. And after becoming clinically accredited, the first 200 consecutive families were seeing about a 50% diagnostic rate. Slightly higher for intellectual disability, slightly higher when you do trios rather than singletons. Um, so leading to an overall diagnostic rate of around 51%. If I drill into some of those disorders to give you some of the flavors, I'm not sure why. I didn't get the format ratio of the slides right, I guess. So one thing we've been looking at a lot in my group for a couple of years is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. This is the most common monogenic kidney disease and one of the most common autosomal dominant diseases available, the one in 500 prevalence. 10% end up with end stage kidney disease, which um, is, leads to expensive dialysis and poor quality of life. You might wonder why whole genome sequencing to look at a disease that's characterized by two genes, PKD1 and 2. 85% of cases are due to mutations in this gene. The answer really is that PKD1 has six pseudogenes with over 97% sequence homology to PKD1, which has led to real challenges in trying to use capture-based sequencing approaches to analyze that gene. So the gold standard diagnostic test is long-range PCR with I think 14 amplicons and Sanger sequencing, which is expensive and laborious. Um, so we thought, can we do better with, with whole genome sequencing? Um, 
Given that pseudogenes, we were really worried about m the mapping quality of the reads to the reference genome. And we've, as we looked in more and more detail, we've started to become more confident that with the longer reads and the lack of capture bias, that the reads were mapping to the right part of the, re the reference genome for PKD1. Here's an example of one of the pseudogenes where all these transparent reads are telling you that it's poor mapping quality. So looking at a bit more scientifically across all the exons and all the regions, the average mapping quality of the reads to PKD1 was close to the max of 60%, which gave us confidence that we had enough precision to get the reads in the right place to think we'd get the variant calls right. When we look at the sequencing depth of every single exon in PKD1, there's 46 exons, we see most of the exons are covered to 15x depth, which is that sort of magic number that we, we came up with before and others have too, except for these exons here, which are marked by high GC content. And this is a known challenge with um, PCR-based library preps. So I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. So when we s recruited a prospective cohort of 28 patients, we, we ended up diagnosing 24 of them for an 86% diagnostic rate. Breaking this down, we see a lot of nonsense. Sorry, this didn't come through Mac to PC very well. But breaking it down, we saw nine nonsense mutations, eight frame shift, four splice site, and one reported pathogenic missense. So nearly all these are loss of function variants consistent with the mode of known genetics of this disorder. As we were working up our structural variation analysis pipeline, we were able to confirm a single exon deletion in PKD2 here, supported by a reduction in read depth and supported by split and spanning reads, which are evidence types that you frequently only get in the genome because the breakpoints are, are within introns. Um, and when we looked at some of the cases that we'd already struggled to sequence with exome sequencing, we, we'd already started this with exomes and only saw a 50% diagnostic rate. We started to look in more detail and we could see regions that were just poorly captured in the exome here. Uh, this is an essential splice site mutation right there that we saw in the genome but was completely absent in the exome and a two base pair deletion in the genome completely not captured in the exome. So as I said we're, we're kind of seeing a lot of cases that have failed an exome and seeing a lot of reasons for the diagnosis on the genome like this. As I said PCR li libraries with PCR struggle with GC rich regions and so we've switched to a PCR free library preparation which has improved all but one exon, this one's actually gone worse, and it turns out this has got some palindromic uh, sequence, so it maybe forms a hairpin on each other. So it's not perfect, but it's getting better. Hereditary spastic paraplegia is a movement disorder characterized by severe stiffness in the lower limbs, um, concomitant with a lot of other symptoms like ataxia, peripheral neuropathy, epilepsy, intellectual disability. So Kishore Kumar, who you can't see there, is a neurologist who joined, joined my group a couple of years ago. And one of the first things he did was go to in Belgaum in India and recruit 11 families with this disorder. Um, it's pretty hot in Belgaum, so the DNA didn't all survive the, the journey back to Australia. Um, but of the nine, sam nine families where we had good quality DNA, we managed to diagnose four of those families. <coughs> this um, shows Two, no, two diagnoses in known HSP genes um, sitting in a region of homozygosity. We developed this tool called ROMA, which I'll probably talk more on the next slide, to help us look at regions of homozygosity, which is important in consanguineous individuals. Interestingly, these last two, dis last two diagnoses were made in sort of phenocopies. Um, so PEC16 is actually a peroxisomal disorder gene, not a classic HSP gene. And the last one that you can't quite see is GLB1, which is a lysosomal disorder gene. So these would almost certainly, well, they would certainly have been missed if we'd done a targeted sequencing approach. So ROMA is a simple tool which uses um, Plink um, and R to generate a, a comprehensive report for a clinical geneticist on regions of the genome that are homozygous. So here you see an affected individual with large blocks of homozygosity, and the candidate gene of interest happens to sit in one of those blocks. So a simple tool, but very useful for the clinical lab to complement their filtering process. The other amazing thing is using genomes for detecting mitochondrial heteroplasmy. So one of the first cases that we looked at showed a sequencing depth of over 20,000 in the mitochondria. And of that, you can see a heteroplasmy of 15%. Heteroplasmy is when you can have different copies of mitochondria, mitochondrial genomes in the same cell. So the heteroplasmy can range really from zero to 100%. Um, so we were really encouraged that with this sort of sequencing depth, we thought we might be able to get down to some really extremely low heteroplasmies in mitochondria. This messy plot over here shows that 
the depth of coverage across every base in the mitochondria is quite variable between different people, but it seems to plat well average out at about 3200x in every genome that we sequence. So this is a really compelling opportunity to look for rare heteroplasmy variants in patients with mitochondrial disorder, including a, an 8KB deletion here with just eight reads out of 2,500, so a really ultra-rare heteroplasmy in a patient with kerns syndrome. So the last, um, last little vignette at this, for this part of the talk is um, a story where we were able to end a five-year diagnostic odyssey for a family. Um, this is one where two girls presented with severe epilepsy, mono, myoclonic atonic seizures, which are the type of drop seizures where you, where you have a seizure and you just drop to the floor, um, as well as photosensitivity and developmental delay. No family history of epilepsy, non-consanguineous family, and the first daughter experienced symptoms from 14 months. These families have been through the classic diagnostic odyssey, hundreds and hundreds of blood tests, hundreds of combinations of anticonvulsants trying to work out what, what the answer was. In the end, we did whole genome sequencing on mum, dad, and both girls, and we found a de novo 13 base pair insertion. It's actually a duplication in this gene called SYNGAP1, which is a classic epilepsy gene. Um, almost certainly, path well, we reported it as pathogenic because of the, the evidence supporting SYNGAP1. Interestingly, along that diagnostic, I should say that they're both de novo, so meaning it's not present in either parent, so it's likely that there's a sort of um, gonadal mosaicism in one of the parents here for them both to have the same variant. Along that journey, they'd gone through a, an epilepsy panel, which did target SYNGAP1, no reads, and they'd also done an exome sequencing, no depth. If you wanted to work out how we solved it, I've got a poster right after this talk on just this story. So again, making diagnoses with a genome that other platforms arguably should have got. So as I said earlier, we've formed a genome diagnostic company called Genome.1 to offer this in the clinical environment. Um, and really that marks a journey of Genome 1 developing a whole suite of germline inherited genetic disorder tests. I'm head of the research division in Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics, so we're now focusing much more attention on developing precision oncology testing, also using a combination of targeted sequencing and whole genome sequencing. And so that's what this part of the, the last part of the talk will be on. I should summarize what I've just, just said for that part. The cost of whole genome sequencing is plummeted in part because of that high CKEX. Good software engineering supports flexibility in a clinical environment and clinical whole genome sequencing is driving about a 50% diagnostic yield through improved coverage and deep phenotyping, which I haven't presented on today. Today we're still only looking at SNVs and indels, and we are clinically accrediting our copy number variant pipeline and our homozygosity tool, and then the next phase will be mitochondrial variant calling so we can get a more and more comprehensive clinical test from a single assay. Um, if Don't underestimate how much time it takes to validate a test. That's one lesson we learned. So mid-2015, um, we started a program in precision oncology, so completely switched gear, <laughs> we moved from, moved from inherited disorders through to sort of precision cancer genomics. So we wanted to, there was a patient came into the hospital next to our institution, um, she was known to us, so we, we kind of pulled out all stops to see what we could do to try and find out something in her genome. So in 10 days from surgery, we had the MDT clinic on the Thursday, surgery on the Friday, all the way through to genomic analysis on the cloud, looking at the annotated list of variants and coming up with a drug target in 10 days. Um, so I got shouted at a lot that week by the lab, but I'm pleased that we could get it through so fast. And that's kind of showed that if we wanted to be able to do this in a two to four week turnaround, that it was at least going to be feasible. Fortunately for the patient, she's been in remission since mid-2015 when, um, when she had her surgery. But along this time, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could tell using liquid biopsy whether she actually is in remission? Um, so this is really when our journey with Kaijin started. Um, we put in a grant for the liquid biopsy grant to propose using Kaijin's liquid biopsy uh, analytes and chemistry to start to investigate circulating tumor DNA across um, the patient journey, combined with, with existing whole genome sequencing and, and targeted sequencing that we had available in the lab. So all the way from using Pax gene blood cell-free DNA collection <coughs> tubes to keep the, the cell-free DNA stable, through to um, Chiamp circulating nucleic acid kits and the ultra-low input uh, Chiagen library prep kit. 
So this data came together about a week ago, and fortunately for the patient, she's in remission. That's what the data is telling us. So it doesn't make for a great talk where we can see her, a relapse for the mutation coming up. Um, but essentially what we did here was we, we sequenced using targeted sequencing of the cell-free DNA at all these different time points with whole genome and targeted. And as I said, we're not seeing a lot at this point. So this was the heroic story that I was going to present to you all, but she's, the good news for her is she seems to be in remission. So I'll present a couple of different ways we're thinking about using liquid biopsy uh, to complement some of the other studies that we're doing in the lab. The other, one of the other interests that we have is looking at tumor evolution. This is a study we published this year in, in Nature Comms, um, looking at a, a case with chronic monomyelocytic leukemia who had an exceptional responder to 5 aza therapy. And here we're looking at the impact of the mutations that were present at the first time of treatment versus relapse. And we see this loss of heterozygosity event driving the, the gain of, of allele fraction of variants that were already present at, the, at treatment, but became selected and ultimately caused to her, her relapse. Um, the slide I'm not showing you shows that these, these variants here went down in frequency, so we know it's a separate clone that's becoming more dominant. Um, so we were lucky in this case, it was, a, it was a leukemia, so we were able to get multiple time points along her journey. But for solid tumors, which my background is actually in pancreatic cancer, it would make much more sense to be able to get this from a liquid biopsy perspective. Um, so in some of our upcoming, I think I you know, took the story out in the interest of time, we're doing some lung cancer sequencing um, paired with circulating tumor DNA to monitor uh, basically tumor relapse and what we can assess from the blood that we can't assess from the primary tumor biopsies. This paper came out which was really encouraging from Arul Chanayan's group where they used exome sequencing and RNA sequencing in children that were refractory to treatment or relapsed and they found potentially clinically actionable findings in tumor or germline in 46 percent of the patients. Of those, I think 25 percent were able to act on those results and 15% had their treatment changed. This is in kids that are failing standard therapy with not much option. At the same time, we ended up with a case that came through our lab, a 10 year old boy with a GBM-like tumor so that he was failing all standard therapy, uh, radiotherapy, temozolomide, uh, wasn't tolerated. He was presented with a local recurrence and the oncologist had no idea what to do for this, this boy. Uh, this formatting didn't come through from the Mac at all well. But this is kind of the assays that were performed in this, this boy's diagnostic odyssey from a CNV array, cytogenetic G-banding, fish, a methylation panel, a 130 gene panel over in, um, in Germany. Ultimately it came through a research pathway through whole genome sequencing. So it's, I mean, I'm telling you about this story, so obviously we found something. It would have been great if we could see the whole genome come back further up the diagnostic cascade here. Um, we did an eight-day turnaround to see what we could find on about this patient's tumor. Um, obviously, cancer genomic sequencing is a lot more complicated than germline sequencing because you're interested in many different events, gatigus, chromothripsis, you're looking for low frequency variation, you need multiple variant callers. It's a much more complicated bioinformatic exercise. To cut a very long story short, we didn't see much evidence for gatigus. We found a MIC amplification which had already been flagged moderate evidence for microsatellite instability, uh, nothing really in the mutation signatures. And it all came really down to this TSC1 mutation that we identified. So TSC1 is a gene which loss of function mutations are known to predict sensitivity to mTOR inhibitors. Temsorolimus is an mTOR inhibitor that's um, well tolerated, it's available, it could put it into a child and it crosses the blood brain barrier and shows um, efficacy in a number of different disorders. So in the end, the oncologist acted on this information and, and delivered serolimus to the patient for three weeks um, and commented that the patient's going extremely well, better than expected. He's left the hospital and he's at home riding a bike. So that was a pretty good day and a, a pretty good week in a translational genomics lab is to be that close to the patient to make that sort of impact. So I think this was probably the turning point for, for me is to go down this route for delivering genomics in, in the clinic this way. Unfortunately, we got to him too late and he did um, had an MRI scan and showed further progression. So we really want to work out how to get this type of technology in, being used to help these patients earlier in the diagnostic process. Um, so obviously 
Liquid biopsy would be great for early detection, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure how often you'd use early detection for a 10-year-old boy. I'm thinking more like an adult early detection of cancer. Um, but there's an obvious benefit for, for using liquid biopsy to try and get early detection on tumors before they get to the advanced stage. So on the back of that study, we joined this um, zero childhood cancer study, which was initiated by the Children's Cancer Institute and the Sydney Children's Hospital. It's a network of all the pediatric oncology sites around Australia, all connected, all willing to give their pediatric patients that are failing therapy to the, the one program. Essentially, they're diagnosed with high-risk cancer, come for a whole suite of diagnostic testing, including whole genome profiling and targeted sequencing, RNA sequencing, in vitro and in vivo models. This is a really large nationwide study, and hopefully by the time we've learned something, we can improve or tailor their, their treatment. Obviously, I would love to be able to do circulating tumor DNA to monitor the response of these patients to the, the, the therapies that we're able to come up with. Um, I just need to work out how to get that funded, but we'll do that. Um, and so this is a really exciting prospect. There's 400 kids gonna get recruited over four years, and our goal is four-week turnaround, whole genome sequencing, um, to try and improve the treatment of these cases. So this data is pretty fresh too. In the first 24 cases that we've looked at, predominantly we're seeing central nervous system tumors, and we are seeing a remarkable spectrum of genomic aberrations in these different cancer types. Even within all the sarcomas, you see this evidence for chromothripsis here, you're seeing extremely structurally variant and massively mutated sarcomas. There's a whole range that look almost completely benign. So I think trying to work out how to treat these tumors each individually is gonna be a real challenge. The knowledge base is extremely important here. And we're starting to use the Ingenuity Variant Analysis Platform because of its knowledge base. I mean, in part because we're dealing with so many different tumor types, we need access to the, the knowledge base to know what the important mutations and drivers are in each of those tumor types. So at a cursory look, I'm not seeing anything obvious in the germline or somatic drivers related to these known um, cancer types in these three tumors, but we haven't really investigated the copy number of variants, which is what I think um, are gonna be characteristic for the, the potentially the, the, the clinically actionable variants within these patients. So, so it would be great if we could include circulating tumor DNA into those cases. So the final study I will mention is that we've just embarked on a molecular screening and therapeutic study where we'll recruit a thousand patients, sequence them with a with a 300 gene cancer panel as well as standard pathology um, and enroll them onto 12 different treatment arms. So it's a bit like the NCI MATCH study, um, but based in Australia, it's the first of its kind in Australia. It's opened a couple of months ago. I think we're up to about 17 patients recruited now. And again, it's a four week turnaround, rapid diagnosis of patients, leading the molecular tumor board meetings and presenting these findings so we can try and put these patients onto different treatment arms. Um, so really exciting opportunities to translate the genomics and the clinically accredited lab that we've got to bring these types of tests through to the clinic. Again, wouldn't it be cool if you managed to enroll patients onto a treatment arm and then monitor those, their response to therapy and their tumor evolution journey through circulating tumor DNA. So these were some of the ideas that we put in the liquid biopsy grant, which I think is why we, why we were awarded it. And we're, like as I said, we're at the start of our journey and we're looking forward to fulfilling uh, many of those promises that we made. <laughs> so take home messages. We've developed Australia's first clinical grade whole genome sequencing service. We think that's the third or fifth in the world to do that. So we're pretty proud of doing that. And initially it's for the diagnosis of inherited genetic disorders. We've created scalable, reproducible and flexible analysis pipelines with fast turnaround times. I didn't actually mention, but the, we can analyze a whole genome in about 24 hours now in the cloud and the cancer, even a 90X whole genome is about 36 to 48 hours. Um, we can perform rapid turnaround whole genome based cancer diagnostics, but they're challenging, but it seems to be feasible for patients with the greatest need like cancers of unknown primary, relapsed, rare cancers where there aren't a list of known actionable mutations for them, or cancers of the young, which is where our, those two studies I've just mentioned are really trying to focus their uh, efforts. So liquid biopsy offers a unique opportunity for early detection um, monitoring relapse, monitoring the response to therapy, and could, could be useful for highly metastatic patients where there's no resectable primary tumor. And for cancers of unknown primary where you don't know where the primary tumor is, work out the mutation profiles of the ctDNA and make a diagnosis that way. I genuinely believe the time for genomics is 
in the clinic, um, and thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge my, my research group from the Garvin Institute, um, especially Andre Minoche, who's in the audience, for the hard work on the structural variant analysis pipeline. Um, the Greater Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics, including Marcel Dinger, who's the head of the centre, and our patients and families and other clinical collaborators. Great. Thank you.